part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel the sun. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Take a few minutes to greet each other this morning. so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. And you can be seated. Amen. Y'all happy to be in God's house today? Amen. 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 I Amen. want to welcome those of you who braved the weather and the no power uh, to come out. Y'all had a lot more damage here than we had in, in Waynesboro. So I know a lot of you have had uh, no power and you've been without power. You might be without power for a few more days. And I know, you know, we're awful low this morning for that reason. So I'm grateful. Uh, that you chose to come to God's house today. Um, but I also want you to know that God brought you here. Uh, God always. We believe in a sovereign God. God's in control, and he ordains everything. And so I pray as we worship this morning, uh, you'll be open to what God wants to do in you and through you and with you. Um, Charles told me to announce right before the service that if, if you are, you don't have power and you need to take a shower or you need water or anything like that, the church can be open for that. The church will be open for the, anybody who, who needs anything like that. If you know of friends or neighbors or anything, the church is more than happy uh, to accommodate that to help anybody uh, in need. Also, I will make an announcement that we are having a short church advisory team right after this AM service. I've got all the the results from the listening sessions that you guys participated in, the core values audit and all that. I've got all that sorted, and I want to give that to the church advisory team and uh, get y'all praying about what's next. It's an exciting time to be a part of God's work. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let me, let me pray for us, and we'll worship the Lord. Father God, we thank you so much that we get to come to your house, that we get to exalt your holy name, that we get to sing your praises, and that we get to hear your voice, Lord, when your word is read and spoke. So, Lord, we just, we praise you, uh, Lord, that you've protected us through this, this bad weather. Uh, we praise you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, we praise you that you are a God who saves souls. Uh, and, Lord, we just ask you to work here today. Lord, we just take a moment here at the beginning, and we ask you to just give us a quiet, calm spirit as we gather and, Lord, we ask you to, to move however you want to move and to do whatever you want to do, Lord. We just give you our service, and we ask you to be present. Lord, we don't ever want to do anything without your presence. So we ask you, Lord, to come. Father, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. 
Since then I walk in forgiveness All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past are broken At last I got saved Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've received nothing but goodness I've tested and tasted your grace I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and I'm made a right He got a hold of my life I've got Jesus, how could I want more? The love of God gave me his pardon. The love of God won't let me stay the same. The love of God pulls me up higher. His will is stronger, that's why I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've got Jesus, how could I want more? Down here, my burden's heavy and the road is rough and long sometimes my feet get weary and so sore but a brighter day is coming soon i'll step on heaven's shore and i won't have to worry anymore i won't I reach the other shore, all my troubles will be over, and I'll rest forevermore. My eyes will be on Jesus, and my heart will be aglow, and I won't have to worry anymore. Someday Life is over, and I've said my last goodbyes. I'm gonna see my Savior standing at the door. Then I'll hear him say, You're welcome. All your cares are left behind, and I won't have to worry anymore. I reach the other shore All my troubles will be over And I'll rest forevermore My eyes will be on Jesus And my heart will be aglow And I won't have to worry anymore My eyes will be Jesus, my heart will be aglow, and I won't have to worry anymore. Amen. How I long to breathe.
breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and every prayer we prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sing through doubt and fear in the end We'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears. Oh, there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And on that day, we join the resurrection. We stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection we stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Forever he shall reign. So let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven. With angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. So let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God, who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Amen. And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That would bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required 
search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry Search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you. Lord, it is all about you. Lord, I am sorry for the thing that we've made it. Sometimes we turn it into a production, a show. We stray from you being in the center and we try to put ourselves in the center. But Lord, we remove the spotlight from ourselves and we put it on you, Lord, because you are the center. Help us, Lord, to keep you there. You are the center of everything. You are our cornerstone. We are nothing without you. And this is why we exist, is to serve you and to bring you glory. Lord, I pray that everyone here is your child. But Lord, if there's anyone in this room or watching online that does not know you, Lord, whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, those that if died right this second would not be breathing the air of heaven. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. For those of us who are your children, Lord, we look forward to that day where death will be no more, where we get to put our worries aside, and we get to spend the rest of our eternity worshiping you. Father, move among us. Help us to receive the word that you have for us. Lord, equip us for the work of your ministry and give us the boldness to do so. We love you. We trust you. We ask that your will be done in our lives. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. You can be seated. We have one more song for you this morning, a special music from, uh, from our youth. Come on up, guys.
Denk mal. God who was, we sing to the God who is, we sing to the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Because we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. There is joy in this house. There is joy in this house today. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Good morning. I'm going to be a little over here. Nevaeh, you want to scooch with me? Why do we have the lights? 
man, everybody's been asking me that. I've been walking around the hall with a lamp, and they're like, why do you have a lamp? Why Why do we have a lamp? You think we're talking about Genesis here? Guess what? You're wrong. <laughs> hey, who, raise your hand if you guys lost power this weekend. I did. Okay, I raise your did. hand if your power is still out. Really? Oh, yeah, Lottie Sue, yeah. Look, we don't have any power at our house. Is, are things hard without power? No power at your house either? No. Hold on, hold on, real quick. Daddy put the his power chain to our Yeah. By our house. Yeah. Pocket, so we can get more power. Whoa. Because look, it's easier with more power, right? Yeah. Is it? Has it been hard not having power at the house? Yeah. Look, do you, do you sometimes go and try to flip the light on and nothing happens? Yeah. yeah. I do too. You go into the bathroom and you're just like, click. Oh yeah, that's not right. <laughs> oh. Uh-huh. I know, you just click it, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I do that all the time. Well, we don't have any power at our house either, and I thought that you guys would probably understand what it's like to not have any power, right? All right. Okay, do you know that there is power that God has too? You know God is powerful? So I don't understand anything about electricity. And really, I don't know that I really understand God's power and how great it is either. But I thought maybe we could talk about it a little bit. So this is our lamp, but is it working right now? You have to plug it in. You have to plug it into what? The wall. The wall. What comes out of there? Electricity. Electricity, the power, right? And so in order for our lamp to work, I have to plug it in to power. Let's see if it works now. I'm trying. Here, oh, oh, there we go. See, look, now it works, right? And so if I'm plugged in, it works. If I'm not plugged in, it doesn't work, right? That's how, that's, that's the simple electricity that maybe I understand, okay? Hey, get your fingers off of there. <laughs> okay, well, look, in order to do, listen, in order to do God's like to do powerful things with God, we have to be plugged into what? <laughs> to God, right. How do we get plugged into God? By knowing the Bible. Know to know it, we have to what? Read it. We have to open it. We've got to read it. So reading our Bible can help us get plugged into God. What else can help us get plugged into God? Um, praying. praying, talking to him. You get to know more about God. Plug into God by just talking to him, praying. What else, son? Oh, that's right. Did that quiet time? Because do we learn more when um, everything around us is just super crazy and doing all sorts no. of different things and we're trying to learn? No. We learn more when we're being... Yeah, it's too loud. Do we learn more when we're having some quiet time? Yeah. So plugging into God with some quiet time, plugging into God with some prayer. Plug in. I said Lord, he said help me. Oh, that's right. For the Bible tells me. Yeah, and see, that, and see, hey, that's a good one, too. How about praising God in song? Singing, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. That's, a t- that's plugging into God, too, being able to, to sing to him, to sing songs about him. That's a good one. Good job. And so in order to be able to do powerful things with God, we've got to plug in just like this lamp has got to plug into power. Now, there are bigger, there are different things that plug in, right? In your house, you've got a lamp that plugs in. How about your oven? Your oven plugs in. Um, your microwave, your refrigerator, all those things plug in. There are different things that we do for God. There's going to be easy stuff that all you got to do is plug in. You just got to plug in, and God's going to work for you. Oh yeah, you just plug it. That's super easy. That's even easier than plugging in, right? Yeah. And so there's going to be easy stuff that God's going to do through you. And then there's going to be some harder stuff. Like, have you guys ever seen a 3D printer? Yeah, I've never really seen one in real life, but I've seen, like, pictures of it. That's something wild, right? I don't know. Do you know how to work a 3D printer? I have no idea. No idea. I've got no idea either. Right. You do? Genius over here. (laughs) So there's going to be.
be some stuff that we're going to have to study hard to be able to have God's power work through us. So that he's going to ask us to do some hard stuff. It may just not be flipping a light switch or plugging in real quick, but maybe working something super technical. God's going to be working hard in us too. Exactly, that's right. Just like in our house, we've got hard stuff and easy stuff that uses electricity differently. Okay? So I want you, when you go home, if you've got power, pray for me, okay? And the others here that don't have any power. <laughs> but also think about that power from God, okay? Anybody want to pray for us this morning? Me. Oh, Harper's going to pray for us. Ready? Okay, let's put, what do we do when our friends are praying? Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you so much for all the power and all the rain that we have. Thank you so much for the beautiful flowers that we have, and amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And while you're turning, I want to say thank you again to my young brothers over here. But that, that was awesome, guys. I'm, I'm serious. That was really, really good. That, that was worth the price of admission today. That was good, that was good stuff. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 16 uh, this morning. And I'll be honest with you. I was really surprised that this particular text and topic was in the series Who's, Who's Your One? As I've said before, this is a a North American mission board emphasis. It's a national thing. And when I opened the series up, when I was kind of looking at the direction of it, I was, I was caught off guard that, that we were going here. Um, and I'm not a guy that gets surprised very much. I don't like surprises. I don't do surprises. And I thought for a long time about when was the last time I was actually surprised. Uh, and uh, my wife, she got me Jimmy Buffett tickets for my 40th birthday. Like, I mean, I, I was a Jimmy Buffett fan when I was a kid. Like, I remember in high school, I had to, I wore Hawaiian shirts to school all the time. So, just as a side note, this just occurred to me. Father's Day, I declared Father's Day a Hawaiian shirt holiday years ago. Right? This is the one day a week, one day of the year, Alicia lets me wear a Hawaiian shirt to church. Right? So you are, you're welcome to join me. It turned into a big thing at Brewston. But anyway, that, that's neither here nor there. Father's Day is a Hawaiian shirt holiday. I'll be preaching in a Hawaiian shirt. But that was, like, it's been a while since I was surprised. And then I go through the series, and it took me off guard that we were going to be talking about hell and this sort of national series, this national emphasis. It's not something you expect um, to be discussed very much anymore. Uh, hell is not a topic that we talk about uh, in our churches. Very little. And I think, I think that's true for a few reasons. I think we don't talk about hell and our church is kind of as a, as a pushback against a previous overemphasis of it. Um, we all know like the old you know, image of the hellfire and brimstone preacher from a generation ago. Uh, we had a, a guy in our church, I sort of collected uh, retired pastors, but we had one guy, his name was Brother Sonny. And I love Brother Sonny. Uh, but I had to be very careful with how often I let Brother Sonny preach or teach. Because uh, for years... If somebody asked Brother Sunday to teach Sunday school, if I got Brother Sunday to preach on Sunday morning, Sunday night, if he was there on Wednesday night, if Brother Sunday was speaking, Brother Sunday was preaching on hell. And that was just the end of it. Like it turned into this big joke that all oh, Brother Sunday's here. I know what we're hearing about today. Um, and I had the honor to, to preach his funeral. And his widow, Miss Linda, she called me. She said, Brother Josh, Brother Sunday, he just loved you. He said, uh, he'd be honored if, you, if you'd come by and look at in his office and He's got all his sermon notes, and I treasure those kinds of things from old pastors. And, and he had in a filing cabinet every sermon he had ever preached since 1971. 
and it was meticulously sort of itemized and, and categorized by topic. So you'd have like salvation and heaven and these sort of things. And I was curious. And so I went to the section on H. And, I, and, and most of the folders were manila folders about an inch, inch and a quarter thick. And there was three manila folders, three inches thick with sermons on hell. As that was Brother Sunday. I got one of them. I got one of them. I got it framed. It's hanging in my office in Waynesboro because uh, that's how I remember Sonny. But we don't, we don't talk about hell like that much anymore. And, and I think, you know, it's to the detriment of the church. There's good theology in hell. Uh, we don't talk about hell. Uh, it makes us uncomfortable. And it should make us uncomfortable. You're right, brother. It, it, it should make us uncomfortable. But our, our churches, by and large, are coming to a place where we value comfort more than Jesus. We just want to come. We want to sit. We want to check it off. Check it off the list. And so we don't talk about it because we're uncomfortable. We don't talk about it, I don't think, because we don't really believe in it. I've talked a little bit about this in the past. There's a difference in a held belief and a core belief. A held belief is something that intellectually we say is true. A core belief is something that we know is true and it motivates actions. If we really believe the truth about hell, there's only one possible action to be engaged in. And so I don't know that we really believe in hell the way we ought to believe in hell. And, and I don't think in large part, at least in a lot of our churches, we don't really think a loving God would actually send somebody to hell. You know, he's a, he's a lovey-dovey God, you know. I talk all the time, he's about hippie Jesus. Like, he's got Birkenstocks and a robe and, a, you know, the long hair. And this, he loves everybody, man. But he doesn't see anybody to hell. People choose him. And so my prayer this, this morning for this, this text we're looking at is, is that God's people would get a burden for the lost around them. And I've been praying this week some of the, the scariest prayers I've ever prayed. Um, that God would let me glimpse only a fraction of the horror of hell. Because I don't think you could ever really see what God's word says about hell and it not change your life. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're in Luke chapter 16, and we're going to read a story. It's a, it's a fairly famous story in the scripture, and, and I believe this is an actual story. There are some, some commentators, some theologians will say it's a parable, but there's nothing linguistically in the construction of the text that would suggest it's a parable. I believe this is an actual, literal story that happened that Jesus tells. So we're in Luke chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 19, and we'll just get the whole story. We'll go down through verse 31. But Jesus says there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate there was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22 the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. Verse 25, but Abraham said, child... Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you're in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Verse 27, he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send them to my father's house where I have five brothers so he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither then will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Father God. All of history, all of everything in existence has a purpose, and its purpose is to display your glory on a global scale. Lord, you didn't save us so that we could go to heaven. You saved us so that we could be on mission with you. 
and nothing in the world should motivate us like the reality that, that hell is real and people we love are really going. And so, Lord, I pray whatever it takes, however painful or frightening may it be, Lord, I pray that you will make this real to us. What awaits those who do not know Jesus? And Lord, I pray it will be in the core of our being and it will drive us to take the gospel across the street, down the road, and around the world. Father, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. That's a very simple story. There was a, a, a rich man, a wealthy man, who had much. There was a poor man named Lazarus who was a pitiful, wretched beggar. And Lazarus was at the rich man's doorstep, and it said that he desired to eat the food that fell from his table. Now, this is, this is not, he was just waiting for the crumbs that landed on the floor. What he meant was out of the overflow of the rich man's house, the rich man fed Lazarus. Both of them died. Lazarus goes to heaven. The rich man goes to hell. And the rich man from hell, he can look out over this great chasm and he can see Lazarus. And he can see Lazarus' comfort and he can see that he's there with Abraham and, and he cries out in anguish, and he says, just send him to give me a drop of water and quench my thirst, for I am in anguish. I am suffering horribly. And Abraham says, no, can't do that. And he says, well, if you can't do that, if you can't comfort me, then at least send somebody to my family, to my brothers, so that they don't come here. And Abraham says, no, we can't do that. He said, even if a man rises from the dead, they still will not believe. And they did not believe because another Lazarus rose from the dead and they didn't believe. And Jesus rose from the dead and many still don't believe, right? He says, though, in verse 29, he says, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So this is the mechanism by which Jesus calls sinners to saving faith. Romans 10, 17 says, By hearing right, comes faith. It's through the Word. When people hear the Word of God, when they hear the Gospel of God, that's the designated mechanism by which He draws sinners into a relationship with Himself. How will they hear if we don't tell them? Isaiah 52 says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. Ah, man, I don't know about you. I worked in a hospital a long time. I've seen a bunch of nasty feet. I am not a foot guy. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. And that's at the core of the text. It's not a text to, to frighten you about hell or, or to scare you into a relationship with Jesus. It's, at the core of the text, Jesus is, is, is sending the believers on a mission to share the word of God with people who are far from God so that they might know God and avoid the fate of the rich man. This is who will warn them. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at, we're going to look at hell. We're going to get an overview of hell. Hell is a topic that came up fairly regularly. I used to love to do a Q&A. Um, about once a quarter, I would just open it up and we would just do a question and answer with all the people in the church. And, and it was always a really good time. They always really enjoyed it. And I was able to answer questions with, that people really had because I don't always know what's on people's minds. And I did a Q&A one time over heaven and, and I sort of framed the entire series around it. It was, you know, what, where is heaven? What is heaven like? What will we be like in heaven? What are we going to do in heaven? So on and so forth. And so this morning as we look at this text on hell, we're going to take the opposite. We're going to, we're going to take the same framework and apply it to hell. And so the first question is to say, well, what is hell? And we're going to have a doctrinal understanding about hell. We've first got to know what hell is. And it's one of those things that's really hard to define. It's really difficult to wrap our minds around what hell is because we don't have a framework for understanding. Like there is nothing in this life where we can say hell is like that, only worse. And that makes it, that makes it really, really Difficult. Hell is completely other. It's on another plane of suffering and horror. But when we have a framework, like I could walk out here 
in, in the parking lot, and I could point at one of those things with wheels on it and say, what is that? It's got an engine. Well, it's a car. And you could look at an electrical vehicle that doesn't have an engine. So what is that? Well, it's a car. And I understand that because I understand the other vehicle, right? We don't even have any framework of understanding for hell. And so I'm going to do my, do my best to help us understand what we can in our, in our limited imagination and our, in our limited instruction on it. But I'll give you a definition that I wrote this week about hell. Hell is a, incomprehensible, is a place of incomprehensible horror reserved for those who do not embrace the gospel. Hell is a place of incomprehensible horror for those who do not embrace the gospel and conceiving of only a fraction of the incomprehensible horror will change your life forever. Hell is a place of incomprehensible horror. And by what I mean by that is hell is a place where God's wrath is poured out. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 says that hell is the wrath to come. Romans chapter 2 verse 8, for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, there will be wrath and fury. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Jesus says that he will inflict vengeance on those who don't know him. Hell is a place where God's wrath is poured out on sin. I understand that doesn't really jive with our culture today. Because God is this ooey-dooey, lovey-dovey God. He's He's the big daddy in the sky. I cringe whenever I hear somebody come to the Lord with that. Like, he's my buddy. He's the big daddy in the sky. And I'm going to lift up my prayers. He's the, in, he's the incomprehensible sovereign God of the universe. He's not your best friend. He's furious over sin. Over your sin. Over my sin. And the Bible teaches that his wrath is stored up. He's not ignoring it. He hasn't forgotten it. He's not going to brush it under the rug. The Bible teaches that, that God's wrath is real. The wrath of God Almighty rests on us over our sin. And it is stored up for the time to come, the judgment to come. And the judgment will come. It says, the Bible says it is appointed once for man to die. And then comes the judgment. You do not know Jesus. The judgment is the wrath of God. That's what hell is. It is a place of incomprehensible horror reserved for those who do not embrace the gospel. And then we get into the next question is what will hell be like? What will hell be like? And again, you don't really have a framework for understanding this. But there are a few descriptor words in the Bible uh, that help us at least get a picture of what hell will be like. Uh, the first word I pulled out is Gehenna. The word Gehenna. Jesus uses that in Matthew chapter 5 in reference to hell. And in the Old Testament, the valley of Gehenna is the place where the children of Israel will go to worship Molech and they would burn their children and sacrifice. They would burn their little babies and sacrifice to this false god Molech. There's this big, huge bronze statue and, and in the, the statue's lap there was this fire and the children of Israel, they would come up with their babies and they would throw their baby into the lap of this false god. And so when Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 is talking about hell, he's going to that image. Of like, this is what it is. This is the, the depths of the depravity and the wickedness. But then by the time you get to the New Testament, the, the, the image of Gehenna had that association, this place of evil and wickedness attached to it. But it was also, at that point, it was the dump for the city of Jerusalem. All their trash, all their refuse they threw into the valley of Gehenna and they lit it on fire and it was out there burning and they throwed the, 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 the bodies of decomposing animals. You know, and we see roadkill all the time around here. They had animals in Jerusalem and they would collect these animals and they would throw them in the valley of Gehenna and then prisoners who were executed, they would just toss their bodies off into the valley of Gehenna. And so when Jesus uses this term Gehenna in reference to hell, he's conjuring up this imagery of unimaginable filth and just the sights and the sounds and the smells of dead, decaying, rotting flesh of criminals and animals and all types of filth and wickedness and evil. Gehenna. Gehenna. 
Another word the Bible uses to describe hell is the second death. Hell is the second death. The Revelation chapter 21, 18 refers to hell as the second death. And this again is not physical death. We're all going to die physically one time. So what is the second death? That's the death of opportunity. Hell is the place where opportunity goes to die. Every single person living and breathing right now has the opportunity to come to Jesus. In hell there is no opportunity. It is the death of opportunity. There are no Sinners being saved out of hell. There is no purgatory. There is no place where you, where you pay a, a little price and then you get released. It is the death of opportunity. You get one shot to come to Jesus. You get one shot. It's the death of opportunity. Hell is the place where grace goes to die. It's the death of grace. I want you to think about the happiest moments in your life. Maybe as you're child when they were a baby and they were just laughing. I love a good baby belly laugh. Just the happiest moments. Those are all a gift of God's grace. Every joyful moment that has ever been in existence for the believer and the unbeliever alike is a gift of God's grace. A couple weeks ago when we were in Florida, I had to to preach at our uh, statewide staff meeting on Wednesday. That's what I do with my vacation. I preach on vacation. <laughs> but I did it on God's grace because I got it one morning for my quiet time and I was in God's grace is sufficient for you. And What does that mean? And I looked at all these different types of God's grace and there's a point of God's grace to meet every single need you have. And one of them, it really struck me, is God's common grace because the Bible says that God makes it rain on the believer and the unbeliever alike. And that rain grows your crops and it grows their crops and it provides food for them. And God makes the sun shine on the believer and the unbeliever. And so the same warm Florida sun that I was enjoying that was making me joyful was shining on the most pagan heathen down there. It's a gift of God's grace. In hell, grace dies. There is no more grace. And there is no more moments of joy and happiness, even for a brief fleeting moment. Hell is the place where your volition goes to die. And now you can do whatever you want to do. And some of y'all are all about that to to varying degrees. Like, I'm I'm all, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. Can't nobody stop me doing it. Shane told me the other day, you can drive as fast as you can afford, right? (laughs) I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You can do whatever you want to do. It's not so in hell. Hell is the place where your volition goes to die, where your will goes to die. You are no longer in control of your own destiny, your own self, your own purpose, your own direction, your own actions. Hell is the place where your volition goes to die, and hell is the place where your hope goes to die. There is absolutely no hope of being set free. It is final. And so when the Bible calls hell the second death, it it means the death of opportunity, the death of hope, the death of volition, the death of grace. It is over. In the valley of Gehenna. Third term that I found that describes hell is flame or fire. You see that in verse 24 uh, in our text. Matthew chapter 13 it says, The angels will come out and separate the evil and the, and from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 says it is eternal fire. Revelation 14.10 calls it the unquenchable fire. So fire is a term that that is used to describe hell. And we don't want to be dogmatic about it. I, I believe there are actual literal flames. Uh, but the Bible doesn't demand that there be actual literal flames. Because even inside of the fire metaphor, it's more than just physical suffering. Like that's what we, we, we think about, well, we're going to, you know, the leak of fire and burning of fire and all that. Well, it's going to be intense physical pain. And there will be intense physical pain in hell, but it is so much more than that. Flip over with, flip over with me to Matthew chapter 25. Keep, keep, your, keep your finger in the text. We really need to grasp this. Keep your finger in the text. We're going to flip to Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to look at verses 29 and 30. It's another text. 
reference to hell. Matthew chapter 25, verse 29 and 30. It says, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, everything he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now there are two descriptor terms there. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is more than physical pain. Every single time that phraseology is used, either in Hebrew or in Greek, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, it always refers to a venomous hatred of believer or of unbelievers for things that are righteous. So the weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's not, ah, oh, I'm hurting so bad, it's, oh, I hate you. That is an internal, physical burning of hatred. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so you get the idea of hell that, that in hell there's going to be all these people who are sorry for what they did. You're wrong. The, the, the rich man in our text in Luke chapter 16, he doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't say that I'm sorry. He asks for relief. There is no hint in the text at all that this man was sorry for anything that he did. People are not going to go to hell and be sorry that they didn't give their life to Jesus. They're going to go to hell and they're going to hate him even more. Because the, the, the sorrow and the conviction is an act of God's grace brought on humanity. And there is no grace. It's going to die. And so they burn for eternity with hatred. This is eternal misery. Born in utter hopelessness. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the other one is, is darkness there in Matthew chapter 25. We get the idea that hell, at least I've talked to some people, the idea of hell is going to be this big party, right? You're going to go down with the devil and he's red and he's got a tail and a pitchfork, right? And we're going to drink Budweiser with my friends and it's going to be awesome. I preach funerals like this. I preach funerals where, where the guy was looking forward to hell because he had buddies that went there. And they played highway to hell. He was on the road, man. He was ready. You will be completely alone, isolated, utter darkness. There will never be a moment of comfort. There will never be a touch from another human soul. It's complete isolation for all of eternity where you, in, you burn internally with hatred against all things good, all things righteous, while you endure intense physical suffering all alone for all of eternity. You're stuck with your own thoughts forever. That's what hell will be like. Wrap, wrap your mind around the imagery of the Bible. Look at Gehenna. You can see and smell the rotting flesh and the presence of wickedness and evil. You have no hope of getting out, no desire to get out, no opportunity to get out. Burning internally and externally all by yourself for all of eternity. That's what hell's like. And then we say, well, who is in hell or, or, or what's in hell? Let me go back to Luke chapter 16 for this. I see a few hints in the text. And the first thing I would say is that good people are in hell. Good, good people are in hell. For all intents and purposes, this rich man, he was a good man. He was a moral man. He took care of this beggar. He probably took care of more. He fed Lazarus. I don't, like I said earlier, don't, don't get the image in your mind that these were just crumbs and he was just like sweeping them up in the dustpan and go, there you go, you filthy beggar. Like he fed him from his table. This rich man took care of Lazarus. This man is moral and he's caring. And I'm telling you right now, some of the best people you know will be in hell. One, one of my best friends was the kindest, most generous person I have ever known. And when he died, he went to hell. He would give you the shirt off his back, but he never gave his life to Jesus. There, the, friends, there are good people in hell. It is not for the atheist. It is not for the Muslim terrorists lopping off heads. There are good people in hell. There are good prayers in hell. Verse 24, 
The man cries out, Father Abraham. Like there's a prayer to the Lord. There will be sinners crying out to the Lord for relief from their suffering. That is a good prayer. And they will fall on deaf ears. Good people are in hell. Good prayers are in hell. Good memories are in hell. Abraham reminds him in verse 25. He says, remember. Remember, you received the good things in this life. Ooh. How awful will it be to go to hell and remember all the good things, knowing that you'll never touch them again? You'll never hold your wife's hand again. You'll never hear your kids laugh again. There will never be a moment of joy. They score their first basket in basketball or hit their first home run. You'll never go to your favorite places, but you remember them. Good memories are in hell. Good priorities are in hell. He begs them, verse 27 through 28, to send him to my brothers. And this is a good priority. Evangelism is a good priority. And it's in hell. I beg you, send Lazarus to my brothers. Hell is full of good priorities. Let's do this now. It's too late. Hell's full of good priorities and hell's full of good intentions. It's full of good intentions. Hell is not just for outright rebellion. Rejection doesn't have to be active. Rejection of the gospel is passive. Our default position is hell. We are sinners by birth and by action. This is the default position of the human race. We are born with God's judgment on us. And so the only thing you have to do to end up in hell is not give your life to Jesus. Good intentions are in hell. It's not for lack of effort in many cases. As you have your good memories, you can remember the gospel invitation. Rejection can come through apathy and indifference. You know, people who just don't care. They just don't care. Rejection can come through procrastination. I have a friend, and I love him, and he, uh, he knows the Bible every, every bit as well as I do. And he fully intends to give his life to Jesus at some point. But right now, there's a couple of sins in his life that he likes. And he knows, he understands the gospel well enough to know he's like, well, if I give my life to Jesus, I can't continue to do this. And I'm not ready to stop this. And so when I'm ready to stop this, then I'll give my life to Jesus. Be real careful. Rejection of the gospel comes through procrastination and rejection of the gospel comes through ignorance. There are people in this world who have never heard the name of Jesus. And there are people in this community who have never heard a lucid gospel presentation. I promise you. There are people in Waynesboro, there are people in Brewston, there are people around you who have never heard the gospel presented clearly in a way that they could understand, and they're going to go to hell for ignorance. There are about 4 billion people on this planet who have never heard the name of Jesus. And it's the church's job to reach them. If a church doesn't have a global mission strategy, the church doesn't have a mission strategy at all. He says to take the gospel to the ends of the earth because people go, through, go to hell through ignorance. That's what's in hell. Good things are in hell. It's a place of incomprehensible horror reserved for those who do not embrace the gospel. But I want you to understand this hell is not for you. It's not for you. It's not for anybody in this room. My pastor told me a long time ago, don't ever leave them bleeding. I, don't, I ain't ever going to preach on hell without, without preaching on God's grace. Hell is not for you. Hell is not designed for you. And God does not intend for you to go there. God says, the Bible says that God wills that none should perish. Right? I'm going to close. I'm going to close in, in John chapter 14. You don't have to go there. John chapter 14. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Hell is not for you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. 
If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. That's God's intent for you. To prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen me. Listen, friends, as incomprehensibly horrific as hell is, it is not for us. It doesn't have to be. Hell is a place designed for demons, the fallen angels. But it's where all those who don't come to Jesus, through Jesus, in Jesus' way, ultimately end up. And this is the message we have to take to the world. This is the message. I want you to know this. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, what I just described is for you. But it doesn't have to be. By faith, if you will surrender your life to Jesus and repent and turn and walk away from your old life, say, I will follow you all the days of my life. Friend, you can be saved. You can have heaven and avoid the horrible faith that awaits all of us but it is 100% up to you. You have the opportunity. You have the will to do, the volition to do whatever you want to do. You have the hope of future salvation. You have it all. It's entirely up to you whether you surrender your life to Jesus or not because hell doesn't have to be for you. Brothers and sisters, if you've given your life to Jesus, that's the word we take to the world. You have people in your life, and this is what who's your one is all about. You have people in your life who are going to live. They're going to be born. They're going to live their entire life in the shadow of this church, and they're going to die and go to hell unless somebody changes that. And that's why the Sermon on Hell is in this series. It's not a hellfire and brimstone sermon. It's not a sermon you know, scares people into heaven. It's a sermon so the church would join the mission of Jesus. And so I ask you, who's your one? Who's your one? You know, everybody has one person. Pray for them, share the gospel with them, and bring them to Jesus. If nothing else, bring them in here on March the 19th. Bring them to Jesus. Because hell is real. And people are really going. Father God, I pray you'll take this, Lord, and make it real. And I don't, I'll be honest. I've wrestled with this all week. I don't like preaching this stuff. You know my heart. You created me. Well, I'd much rather preach on heaven, on glory, on joy, on worship. Lord, you called me to preach the whole counsel. And hell is a real part of your word. And it is the real place that people are really going who don't embrace Jesus. So, Lord, I pray right now for anybody in this room, and in the sound of my voice, anybody listening online, Lord, I pray that the day is the day they give their life to Jesus. Hell is not for them. Make that real. And for the rest of us who do know you. Father, forgive us for not living with some urgency. We live on mission with Jesus. I have watched my friends go to hell. Forgive me. God, help us. Let your believers get on mission with you, Lord. And Lord, lift our spirits as your word says. Let your hearts not be troubled. Lord, we praise you for your grace. I praise you for your grace. Lord, I'm, I'm Paul. I'm chief among sinners. I deserve hell, Lord. You, you gave me salvation. You gave me Jesus. You gave me a new life. And Lord, I long for the day that I get to see you face to face. Mm. 
We praise you for that, Lord. And in the interim, empower us and equip us and enable us to join the mission of Jesus and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Father, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me as we have our invitation time? If you need to come, I would invite you to come. Come and pray for your one. Come and grab me. If you need to give your life to Jesus, come right now. Whatever you need this morning, I would invite you to come. Would you come? We'll sing one more if Charles wouldn't mind, and we'll be here at the front to yeah. pray with you. To you need to come. To you. Would you come?
watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Mind us, church, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, it tells us that, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't know word for word, but it says that if, if we are called, if God puts somebody on our heart to go, to, to go preach the gospel to, to teach them, and we don't do it, and they end up dying and going to hell, their blood is on our hands. So this is, this is a big deal, and we will atone for that on judgment day. Pray earnestly, church, for the equipping, for your equipping and for your courage, as it is our job to share the gospel. We don't want that blood on our hands. church today? Amen. <laughs> it's a little quiet after you preach on hell. Right? <laughs> I love you guys, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you are who you are. That sermon I just preached ain't getting preached in 90% of the churches I serve. Uh, we're people. I'm grateful that you're passionate about God's Word, uh, passionate about the grace of God, the hope of God, the gospel of God. But thank you from the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board for being who you are. It matters. And so I thank you guys for that. Uh, quick reminder, we'll have a church advisory team uh, meeting briefly right after the service. We'll be in the room over here. Uh, anybody got anything else that needs to be mentioned? All right. Pray for the pastor search team. They're getting started. Got a timeline laid out. I'm going to launch pretty quickly. Keep that in your hearts and minds as you pray for that. Pray for not God's next man. Absolutely. All right, may the Lord keep you and bless you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a week, church. If anybody does need to come use the church to shower or get water or whatever, um, please get with either, either Adriana or myself so we can uh, be here and, you know, unlock the doors for you and any, everything like that. So, appreciate it.